Let me get this to you. Oh, yeah. Put that somewhere. Yep. Well, I'm glad to uh, get to be with you and talk a minute. Uh, three uh, theses about the Bible. First thesis is that the Bible, most of the Bible, Old Testament and for Christians, the New Testament originated in a context of a predatory economy that was extracting wealth from vulnerable people to transfer it to powerful people and that was practicing unfair allocation of resources. There was a lead story in the New York Times this morning. Did you see it? A long article saying that inequality is only going to get worse and worse and worse and none of our efforts will do anything and the only thing that will disrupt it will be a war. So that's the context in which we read the Bible. The second uh, learning I've had about the Bible is that uh, the biblical communities of Israel and in the early church in the New Testament make a response to the predatory economy that is one of resistance and that proposes a neighborly alternative. And the third learning I have had is that the Bible is best read in a context of a predatory economy which means we got the best context in which to read the Bible because we live in a predatory economy that practices unfair allocation of resources. So that's kind of the overview of uh, what I've been uh, learning lately and uh, then what I want to do because the Bible does it, you have to reduce those theses to narrative. So uh, Peter's going to have us tell stories after a while the Bible is essentially, I propose, a series of stories about a predatory economy and a neighborly response to the predatory economy. So the first and big story that governs all of the other stories is the story of Pharaoh in Egypt. And Pharaoh may or may not have been an actual historical person, but what Pharaoh really is, is, is a type or he's a metaphor He's a stand-in for all predatory economies. And the story of Pharaoh is a story of a nightmare about scarcity, a policy of accumulation, the success of monopoly, and then, as will always happen with monopoly, that in, with accumulation that ends in monopoly, it finally ends in violence. So predatory economies are intrinsically violent. That story of Pharaoh is in the book of Genesis and when you flip over into the first chapter of Exodus where we meet the children of Israel who have become slaves, it says that uh, Pharaoh treated them harshly, which means they had incessant production demands because they had debts that they couldn't pay and they had debts that they couldn't pay because of Pharaoh's predatory policies. So that's the context in which the, the most uh, paradigmatic story of the Old Testament arises and Moses is the lead character uh, in a response to uh, that predatory economy. And the mosaic drama takes place in three parts, and you know those, but it's useful to think about them because uh, our response to the predatory economy might be in three parts. First part is the exodus narrative, which means to exit the predatory economy. And uh, what Peter has uh, taught me, and many of you know, that one way to exit the predatory economy is to keep the money local. That's an exit from the predatory economy to keep it out of the hands of the banks. The second moment in Moses' response is the incredible experience in the wilderness of abundant bread, abundant water, 
and abundant meat. So he got a water from rock, he got bread from heaven, and he got meat from quail. And the Bible doesn't explain any of that. But what the Bible affirms is that if you run the risk of getting outside of the predatory economy, you move from frightened scarcity to inexplicable abundance. And the problem is that we cannot know that ahead of time. The third moment in Pharaoh's work is at Mount Sinai in which he got the ten big rules for neighborliness. The Ten Commandments are ten rules for neighborliness at the center of which is the commandment about Sabbath which is a rule to say do not bust your ass to prove to, to gain approval from Pharaoh. That's what Sabbath is about. <laughs> And I have come to think that in our society, Sabbath is the most important and the most difficult of all of the commandments. Because I go around saying, if you want to keep Sabbath, uh, you have to turn off the NFL. I said that at a wealthy uh, Episcopal church in uh, Charlotte a couple Sundays ago. And the priest started backing me off, said, well, I think people ought to go to church before they go to the football game. And then I found out the reason he was doing that is the owner of the team was in the audience. So it was a little bit uh, tricky about that. So there are incredible provisions in the book of Deuteronomy that protest against the predatory economy. There are provisions that say things like, you have to pay people their wages on the day they earn them. No wage theft. Uh, it says that you cannot take anything in collateral for a loan from a poor person. If they have only one coat, you can take their coat for collateral during the day, but you've got to take it back to them at night because they need to sleep and you can pick it up the next morning for collateral, but then you have to take it back at sundown. Imagine doing that on a 30-year loan. And Moses' idea is you shouldn't bother with it. In Deuteronomy 15, the Mosaic re uh, regulation is at the end of seven years, you've got to cancel debts. Because Moses is determined that there should not be a permanent underclass. And the way to prevent a permanent underclass is to cancel debts. And then in the Jubilee year, Moses ups the ante by saying every 49 years, you've got to give everything back to people, everything you took from them, which is uh, redistribution and reparation. So the Bible is essentially, from the Mosaic tradition, is an act of alternative to the predatory economy. Now, very quickly, I think I've used up my time, but very quickly, I want to tell you about three re-performances of the Exodus narrative in the Bible. Two of these you will know about, one of them you may not know about. First, Solomon, King Solomon, was Pharaoh's son-in-law, and he is the principal predator inside Israel. So Solomon taxed people to death. So Solomon must have been a primordial groper, if I can use that presidential word, because he had 300 wives and 700 concubines. Uh, and he is known for having built the grand temple in Jerusalem that is built with gold, 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 and cheap labor. The gold came from predatory commerce and taxes, and the cheap labor meant that he didn't have to spend much of his gold to build the temple. So the temple in Jerusalem is a monument <laughs> 
predatory economics. And if you read the text carefully, the biblical God says, I ain't going to stay there. You can't put me in a place like that and expect you to stay there because I am a God of emancipation. The response to Solomon's predation is a whole prophetic movement of the 8th and 7th centuries BCE in which their oracles are essentially an expose of the predation of the elite in the city of Jerusalem. The second reperformance of the Exodus in the 5th century BCE under the Persian government, see if this sounds contemporary, what, what, what those empires did, the empires basically exist to collect revenue. That's what all empires do, including the U.S. empire. And what they do is they hire locals to collect the taxes to send to the imperial capital. So Nehemiah is uh, one of these governors that uh, collects money to send to Persia. He taxes other Jews. In Nehemiah 5, if you do not know Nehemiah 5, see if you can find it in your Bible and take a look. Nehemiah 5 says that people were having to sell their children to pay their taxes and to sell their fields uh, to settle their mortgages. They, they were desperate. And when Nehemiah, the governor, hears about it, he is indignant. And he calls a meeting in Nehemiah 5 of Jews who were vulnerable and Jews who were predators. And he says, you guys are all Jews. You need to stop doing this to each other. And he forced them into a covenant. Now, mutatis mutandis, what I want to suggest to you is that what has happened in our society is that very many people have been so trapped by the empire, by the predatory empire, that they have forgotten that they are human. And when you forget that you are human, you can exploit other human beings and not notice that they are human. So the work of somebody like Nehemiah is to get these people who have forgotten they are human and to remind people of their common humanness, which requires economic solidarity that is worked out as jubilee. The third re-performance, that I'll do in one sentence, is that the Roman Empire was another predatory system and in the New Testament the Jesus movement is essentially a response of a neighborly economy to the predation of Rome with which some Jews had colluded. Uh, simply observe how Badly we have read the New Testament when we have thought it had to do with private sin and going to heaven. When in fact the New Testament is essentially about a neighborhood alternative in economics. Jesus got executed by Rome because the empire is scared to death of a neighborly economy. And it could well be that we are the fourth reperformance of a neighborly economy in the face of predation. So how about any thoughts, things that strike you, questions, comments? Uh, any thoughts, anything to strike you in the...
place you want to take what he said. Okay. I think that the uh, the consumer economy is our participation in an unsustainable standard of living and the reason that we have to have such an incredibly strong military is to protect an unsustainable standard of living. If we, if we didn't have to be uh, managing and manipulating the world economy through globalism, uh, which we have to do to sustain the way, we're, some, the way some of us are living, we would need to spend ourselves uh, into oblivion for the military. Does that make sense? That's what I think. And I, I think uh, uh, our, our moral capacity to live that way is grounded in the theological notion of American exceptionalism. We are, in fact, God's chosen people, so we are entitled to live this way at the expense of many other people. That's what I think. And that's what makes it so hard. Who wants not to do that <laughs> when it's so terrific? That's what I think. Uh, the, the New York Times wouldn't have had that scary article on inequality uh, if we were not propelled by greed that is grounded in our fear of running out and being scarce. So it's an endless proposition in which most of us continue to go through the motions, and the longer that we participate in this unsustainable scheme, the less we stay in touch with the humanity of our neighbors. Because all of our neighbors turn into rivals and competitors and threats. That's what I think. So Donald Trump, for example, has this long list of neighbors whom he perceives as threats. And uh, that's, uh, that turns out that's a, a winning way to label people, and then you don't have to be neighborly. Hey, Peter, that's your question. <laughs> I just read ancient texts. <laughs> well, uh, obviously, it has to do with creating neighborliness. It has to do with uh, helping people position themselves in uh, networks of support and obligation. Uh, and uh, to abandon people without that kind of human network uh, uh, is to abandon them to death. So uh, it, is a, it is a matter of networking uh, in very local ways. Uh, I think that, that is very difficult to do, but no substitute for that. And I, th I think the case I cited about Nehemiah, when he forced the have and have not Jews into covenant with each other, he was creating a network uh, 
of mutual responsibility and support. And I think you can see that in Paul's letters as well. You know, Paul in, in Galatians, almost back to back, he says, everyone must bear their own burden. And then right quickly he says, bear one another's burdens. You got to do both. Yep. Yep. Anybody else like to make a statement, ask a question? Keep Walter here longer because that was my goal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bergman, I wonder if you could answer a little bit of a picture of if today the church went into the what might that look like? Well, uh, the, the church is being kicked out of Egypt, so we're going to find out. Uh, it, it, means, uh, it means to abandon our notions of establishment and entitlement and privilege. Uh, uh, I, I don't want to be dramatic, but it means, as Bonhoeffer said, to become poor men and women after the poor Jesus. And we are, uh, us institutional types, are ill-equipped to do that. But that's what's going to happen. Uh, and uh, institutional types regard that as a great misfortune. It might be the best thing that could ever happen to the church, which, which means we got to sell all these big buildings to someone else and and so on and so on. Uh, in Anderson, where I worship, uh, about two years ago, it's like all at once, everybody just decided to quit going to church. And it's happening. And I think for the institution church, that's the chickens coming home to roost for the way we've ordered our life. Uh, and. Uh, doesn't feel very good. It didn't. It didn't. It didn't feel great when they left Egypt. You know, they're they're two verses into the wilderness, and they want to go back. And uh, they 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 say to Moses, "You brought us out here to die." And uh, so the 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 power of Pharaoh to pull it, keep pulling us. It, it's like these movies about people who try to leave the mafia. And you can't get out. You can't get out of Egypt. But you have to go. And so on. Okay. Let me uh, stay here. So it's happening. I don't know if you know Rich at the uh, Emanuel Presbyterian. So he's decided and talked to his church into taking a, a, a sum of money out of their endowment. So most churches think the purpose of people who watch the endowment is to keep it large and invest it in a neighborhood cooperative food market. To me, that is a huge step out of Egypt. And uh, that's a good example. Of that. Any other one more, perhaps? Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. My name is Rob. Forgive us our trespasses, or forgive us our debt. Which one? Presbyterians. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a Calvinist. Explain his question. Uh, he has, in the Lord's Prayer, do we say, forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts? I, I'm a Calvinist. Presbyterians would rather have their debts forgiven than their sins. <laughs> <That right? laughs> but you see, you could also do trespasses, and you could think about how the predatory economy trespasses on the life of vulnerable people. So you can, you can do it either way. Uh, the new translation is, uh, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. The problem with that is that sin is a terribly misunderstood word in the church, and that's probably not very helpful either. Uh, yeah. One more. Right. Robert? I wonder, was there a neighborly economy in the just everywhere in the world? Well, I, I think uh, 
I think we have to think in terms of, uh, not in terms of absolutes, but in terms of relative arrangements. And some neighborhoods are clearly more that way than other neighborhoods. I guess that if one were to try to talk about national economies, one would probably talk about the Scandinavian uh, economies, but I don't know much about that. Uh, I think there are uh, gestures in neighborhoods that that make those efforts, but not not in, not absolutely so. Well, I, if it's in terms of nations, uh, I would I would think those Scandinavian countries uh, come close to it. The, the problem uh, the problem with all of those models for us is that. Uh, no other nation, no, no other nation in the West has a history of slavery. And the history of slavery has wounded all of our possibilities uh, in that regard, which makes it so much more difficult and so much more complex uh, here. That's what I think, yeah. Yeah, okay. yep.